With house prices at record heights and not everyone having access to help from the bank of mum and dad, many Kiwis are asking whether it's worth buying with friends instead of on their own. Hi everyone, in this video we'll look at the pros and cons of purchasing a house with friends, what is involved with getting a mortgage together and at the end I'll give you the six important topics you'll need to discuss long before you start searching for a home. As you'll soon see, it is worth weighing up your options carefully before proceeding with the strategy of buying together with your mates. If you find this video useful, compelling, or just a bit relevant, don't forget to hit the like button and also subscribe to the channel. We've got mortgage education videos coming out every Wednesday. Before we get started, there are two terms that you'll need to know in relation to the ownership structure of a property. The first is joint tenancy. Joint tenancy is the usual method of ownership for couples. Neither party has a divided stake in the property, or in other words, the house is jointly owned by the couple. If one of the owners dies, the house does not automatically become part of a party's estate. In actual fact, the other party takes ownership of the whole property. The second term is tenants in common, also known as tenancy in common. The owners of a tenants in common structure have a distinct share in the property. For example, 20% by person A, 50% by person B, and 30% by person C. Tenants in common is more common approach for a group of friends who have introduced unequal amounts of money into the purchase of a property. It's worth knowing that the owners can transfer or mortgage their share of the house without the other owner's agreement, and if a party passes away, their share will be part of their estate, so that could be tied up in legal proceedings of a contested estate. Okay, so what are the benefits of buying a house with friends? The main benefit is that people who would otherwise have been unable to buy their own home or get on the property ladder can get there sooner. House prices in a hot market can increase quickly, more quickly than some people can save for a deposit. Buying a home with friends earlier in the property cycle means getting these capital gains rather than trying to chase them with your savings. Additional benefits are that the costs of acquisition of the property, such as builders' reports, valuations, and solicitors, are shared amongst more people, meaning less cost to you. Although, as we will see later in the video, the setup of an agreement and exit of a property arrangement can be quite a bit more costly. Probably the biggest benefit is that unexpected repairs and maintenance is divided by the number of owners. If you have a roof needing to be replaced at a cost of $20,000, this cost is now split between you and your friends, rather than just you. So what about the downsides? There are of course some downsides to buying a home as a group, and they are a little more complicated than the more obvious upsides to sharing ownership. Firstly, you have fewer capital gains. Each party only gets the gains from their stake in the property, so if your house goes up by $150,000 and there are three of you with equal shares, you've only made $50,000. Now that's $50,000 more than you would have made if you hadn't been on the property ladder at all, but still worth considering at the beginning of your buying journey whether dividing the gains between your friends is the only property to ownership option for you. Further downsides include that everyone is technically liable for the whole mortgage. If your friend can't pay their mortgage this month, you still need to pay or your credit record is at risk. Tenants in common arrangements don't split the credit record risk. If any part of the mortgage isn't paid, everyone's credit record is affected. Now we hear a lot of, yes, but my friends have good jobs and are good with their money. It's worth remembering that not all mortgage defaults are intentional. In fact, the vast majority are out of your control. Your friend may lose their job because of an employer closing their business, and they may struggle to find new work because unemployment is high. Regardless of the reason, you and other owners will be on the hook for all mortgage payments until the late payer can start paying their way again. Finally, it's worth noting that if you are eligible for the first home grant, Kanga Aura will only pay a maximum of $10,000 per house, or $20,000 if a newly constructed house, so having multiple people as owners reduces the amount each person can get from the first home grant. Let's look now at how getting a mortgage with friends actually works. First of all, it's important to understand that at most banks you are liable for, and therefore need to be able to service, the whole mortgage. In other words, the banks treat all mortgages as though they were joint tenancies. If one or all of your friends skips the country, the bank wants to know that you can afford the whole mortgage. 
This is the point where most people start to realize that buying a home with friends is a little trickier than they thought. If you could afford the whole mortgage apart from needing more deposit, why would you buy with other friends? Well, I did say most banks, not all banks. The lending policy changes occasionally and at the time of recording, there is only one bank that will definitely look at requiring parties to only pay for their own portion of the mortgage. In other words, a tenants in common relationship. And there's also one bank that will consider it if the application is otherwise strong enough. The problem for the banks is that they can't sell a part of a property. So if one person from a group of three leaves, the bank can't simply discharge 33% of the mortgage. One or two banks are willing to take this on, the others aren't. From the bank's point of view, rightly or wrongly, there is an elevated risk of loaning to groups of friends. Fallouts can occur or new relationships can form, meaning unexpected exits of the agreement. All of these things can, of course, happen within couples, but are less likely and more structured with how they end. It's horrible to say, but a divorce is more orderly, from a legal perspective anyway, than your friends wanting to go and buy with their new partner. To really give the bank a strong application, you'll want to show them at least the following things. A formal co-ownership agreement showing all eventualities, at least a 20% deposit between all parties, and good income from the majority of the parties. In other words, don't just have one friend who has savings, but minimum income. Let's look at an example and see what hurdles there are and how we can get around them. Peter, Paul and Mary are all long-term friends and want to buy a house together. They have a 20% deposit between them, which is good for the bank. Peter and Paul are going to live in the property, but Mary is about to get married and doesn't want to live in the house. She just wants to help with the purchase, so she is on the property ladder. They have chosen bank A because that bank will only assess the portion of the mortgage that each person is responsible for, tenancy in common. They have chosen to own equal thirds of the property each. Oh, pop the magic dragon, live by the sea. So what hurdles are there? Well, as Mary doesn't plan to live in the property, she's effectively purchasing this property as an investment, which may affect the loan to value ratio that the banks can lend. Peter and Paul would need to check that the bank is still happy to lend up to 80% when at the time of recording, the maximum a bank can lend on an investment property is 60%. Secondly, although each party is only paying for their third of the mortgage, if say Mary later approaches bank B, for another loan on another property, that bank will assess her as though she is liable for the whole mortgage. In other words, Mary has lost a lot of buying power, the amount of the full mortgage in fact, and only gained a third of the capital gains. Given that Mary is about to be married, the odds of her seeking to purchase a family home soon are higher than normal. This hurdle brings about some interesting questions. If Mary can afford the whole mortgage for the friend's house, and her new matrimonial house, why is she involved in the friend's transaction at all? She's only getting one third of the capital gains when she could afford a whole investment property herself. It's nice to help her friends, but she's giving away, potentially, hundreds of thousands of dollars of capital gains. And if Mary can't afford both mortgages, then she needs to understand that buying a house with her friends is stopping her from buying a matrimonial house in the future, and needs to decide if this is correct for her. A final hurdle unrelated to a mortgage but very relevant from a legal perspective is that Mary is about to get married at which point her existing will will be revoked. Peter and Paul need to make sure Mary's will is up to date post wedding to ensure Mary doesn't pass away intestate or without a will leaving her share of the property illiquid for a certain amount of time. In the example above, Mary wasn't going to live in the property but wanted to help her friends purchase a home. She's decided that being a part of the mortgage unacceptably affects her borrowing capability for the property she wants to buy with her new partner. Could Mary loan her friends $100,000 to reduce their loan but not be on the mortgage? Before we dig into what the banks would think, it's important to say that both parties would definitely want to talk to a lawyer about this. Some discussion points that might be relevant are what interest rate or return Mary is expecting, does she want ownership of the property or just a return on her loan, does she understand that the money may not be retrieved easily, in other words for Peter and Paul to pay Mary back a top up loan would need to occur which may not be possible with future lending criteria. Banks in general require a deposit to come from someone who the creditors have 
natural love and affection for. In plain speak, this is usually means families. Banks do not like home buyers to simply do a whip around of their friends to boost their deposit. However, Peter and Paul could get a mortgage and then Mary could introduce funds into the mortgage to reduce the overall lending. Peter and Paul could borrow $800,000 and have a $100,000 revolving credit. Mary could then loan Peter and Paul her $100,000. As it's a revolving credit, Mary could get the mortgage back at any time and Peter and Paul have reduced their mortgage in the meantime. The benefits that could be therefore that Mary is only getting say 1% per annum for her savings in the bank, while Peter and Paul are paying 5% per annum on their mortgage. If Peter and Paul could pay Mary 3% for her money, both parties would be better off. This would need to occur after the mortgage has been put in place though, and couldn't be part of the mortgage application. Whether or not this is worth all the fuss and risk for what would amount to $2,000 of savings for Peter and Paul, and $2,000 of additional income for Mary is something that each of the parties would need to decide. Okay, so if you're dead set on buying a home with your friends, what topics should you discuss with each other before starting the journey? The first is the exit plan. How do we deal with someone exiting as an owner? Do we allow them to sell their part of the property to anyone, or do you get first right of refusal? How do we agree on the value of the property? Will one registered valuer report be enough or would we want the average of two reports? Finally, who will pay for the exit fees if someone wants to exit, including the solicitor's costs, valuation or valuations costs, etc. The next topic is what are our criteria for buying? Are there suburbs that are no-goes? What features are must-haves in the house? For example, views, easy access, etc. The next topic is repairs or maintenance. If repairs or maintenance is needed, who needs to sign off on these? What if one party can't pay? And what if one party feels the need to do some small repairs because they'll be more expensive if left to deteriorate, but another party doesn't want to pay for those repairs? Along those lines, could we build up a buffer of funds? So if one of us loses our job or has an unexpected expense, we can cover our expenses. Or could life and health insurance cover any risks if one of us passes away or has a serious health issue? In other words, we could set a requirement to have insurance on ourselves as part of a protection against future events. Next topic is flatmates. What are the rules around getting flatmates into our room if we want to move out? What about partners moving in in the future? Is that possible or vetoed by one of the other owners? And finally, what will we do if we need to sell and our house prices have dropped? If we've put in a different amount of deposit, how do we account for this in the event of a loss? All of these topics need to be discussed before starting the journey. Buying a house with friends will be a good strategy for a few people, but not everyone. Our recommendation is that you consider all the risks carefully and don't skimp on the setup of the arrangement, for example, a co-ownership agreement. A couple of thousand dollars now will save you a lot more in the long run when the unexpected happens. I'm Rupert Goff, thanks for watching, talk to you soon.